1 Kings 13. That scene is very analogous of what takes place in the religious world today. Now here's a young man who was a prophet who was told of God to go straight home, not to go eat with anybody or go drink anything with anybody or be around anybody, just go straight home and don't stop. Then there's another man that comes up to him and said, you know, I, I, he said, I also am a prophet of God. He said, God told me to have you come home and eat with me. So the man does. He violates clear teaching that God had told him. There are people in the world today, religiously, that's kind of a, the problem that they have, and we have, we should say, in, in teaching truth. Is there's a lot of times there's a barrier, a stumbling block, if you will, because somebody else is going to tell you something else. I was reading a publication called The Magnolia Messenger. It's been probably in existence for 40 years. It comes out quarterly. It talks about all the things that's taken place in Mississippi and Louisiana, some, you know, the state. <laughs> and the guy's been an editor there, and I know him, his name is uh, Al Franks. And. He said he was listening to radio here about a week or so ago, and he said there was a man there who said, you know, you know, don't let anybody that don't believe, and don't let anybody tell you that baptism is, is essential for salvation. It is not. We know different. There's more people in this room that are Bible scholars than that guy. He, he has the same Bible. He can read what we, we read. But he has been convinced, and I understand how he's been convinced that there was a point in my life I was on that side. I thought you all you needed to do was just believe. Until I studied the Bible. Things kept coming up, and this doesn't make any sense, and this doesn't make any sense. And so, tonight we're talking about a, a, a concept that a lot of people hold, and they'll, you've, you've probably heard people say, well, what difference does it make? What difference does it make if, 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 this, if you use instruments or not? What difference does it make whether you take the Lord's Supper every Sunday or not? And what difference does it make this, that, and the other? Just, just a whole myriad of topics. So does it make a difference? That's what we're going to look at looking at the Bible tonight. There are so many divisions in the religious world. They have different beliefs and different doctrines and different practices, different churches. Doesn't make a difference about any of this. A lot of people believe this concept of well, just one church is good as another. We talked about that. I kind of introduced that idea this morning, talking about why how people choose where they go to worship. But Jesus prayed for unity in John 17. And religious division is in total antithesis of what Jesus wants. He wants unity. And we can have unity, religious unity, in this world. We can't compromise on teaching. We can have unity if we all decide that we're going to submit ourselves to what the Bible says and to follow those type of practices. And again, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, on the night before he was crucified, what was on his mind? He was worried about us. You think what difference does it make? He didn't have to go to the cross difference does it make? All the difference in the world. <clears throat> when we look at what the Bible says about the subject, and we ask ourselves, what difference does it make? What belief? Somebody could be a Buddhist, somebody could be a, a Catholic, or, or whatever religious group. And, and those are two just diverse uh, religious ideologies. Uh, but so does it make a difference? And I, I know folks, I've gone to school with people who were Buddhists. I've seen Buddhists and talked to Buddhists in Thailand. Uh, I've seen you know little boys out there, six or seven years old, in a in an orange tunic and bald head and you know shaved bald, they're out there with a with a broom, sweeping outside the temples. That's his job. There's an old movie years ago called Sand Pebbles, and one guy was he was gonna go wash his clothes, and the guy says no, he said that guy that's his that's his job. And that's not how he said. It. He said, that's his rice bowl. That's what that little boy was doing. That's his rice bowl. It's how he lives. And so and the idea of, of this, is the, this is the rice bowl. It, it, so that's what he believes. 
he's six or seven years old, he hasn't known anything else other than Buddhists. And being a, a, a he was he is a young Buddhist uh, acolyte, if you will. Let's look at some popular concepts that divide us in the religious world. First of all, one says faith alone. Just believe in the Lord. You know, the Bible does sit teach from time to time. It just says you believe. And, and certainly we understand belief is part of, uh, of our allegiance to God. We must believe and not faith alone. Not by any means. James chapter 2 would tell you different. Sincerity is all that matters. And I remember Jesus denouncing the, the religious leaders of the day in Matthew 7. He said, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And many of you will say in that day, in, in, Lord, Lord, in thy name I've done many wonderful works, I've done miracles, I've done all these things. And he says, and when that day comes, I'll say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. He said, I know who you are. So sincere, even though they were sincere, sincere in their activities, they weren't doing what God wanted them to do. It, it takes more than just being sincere. Because you can be sincerely wrong. Join the church of your choice. That, that's always one that you hear, isn't it? I firmly believe that we ought to change that to join the church of God's choice. Jesus' choice. Not the church of your choice. Because there again, that's that concept. Well, it doesn't make any difference, right? Some people say that you know all you need to be to be a Christian is just be a good moral person. Kind of add to that too. Say be a good moral person. Keep the Ten Commandments. That's what people say. Well, that's all you have to do. It doesn't make any difference whether you want to worship this way or I want to worship this way. God's going to accept all of us. That certainly is not a biblical concept. Some people say, well, it just doesn't matter what you believe. Sure it does. If you believe in the Easter bunny, you know that he's a religious person because you see him around Easter time and we celebrate the, a lot of times the uh, the resurrection of Jesus around that time of the year. You'd think some people would even think the, the, uh, the Easter Bunny was a religious uh, individual. Uh, I mean, they're just crazy things. Because if you, if you open the door by saying it doesn't matter what you can believe, then you can literally believe in anything. And that begs the question, what, what, is, what will God accept? Not just anything. You know, he, he doesn't want leftovers. He, you always see throughout the Old Testament, first fruits, the first things, the best things. Sacrifices, you know, had to be unblemished, without spot, can't have a broken leg. Those he, he wanted the best of those things offered to him. He deserves it. He deserves our best. So it, it does make a difference what you believe. And I, you, you hear it from time to time I say this. I said, you know, G, Jesus promised to build his church. And he did that. We see it paid for it with his own blood, Acts 20, 28. So <laughs> if he built it, was going to build it, he built it, and he paid for it with his own blood, then he ought to have the worship of the church the way he wants it. Not the way we want it, not what our heart's desire is, but what his authority gives to us. And he's communicated that to us by, by apostolic, approved apostolic example. We find, you know, in the New Testament, and we see the way in which they worshiped and so we would be what they were uh, if we do what they did. But the problem of it is, is this kind of a concept, and it doesn't make any difference what you believe, is a barrier to the gospel. Because it's, you know, well, I don't have to believe that. Uh, and I, you know, it doesn't make any difference what you believe. But it, the, the teaching is hindered if you, do, if you can believe whatever you want to. And you don't have to believe what the Bible says. You make up, again, what, whatever you want. And the problem is the gospel can't get through with people who have that type of mentality. We have to change that. We have to inform them. We've got to teach them. Because if it doesn't make any difference, if we don't need the Bible, then there's no need to study. There are issues that we have. Religious issues are trivial. Uh, we can feel comfortable in what we're doing. Um, we have a church, so what else do we need? Remember that painter this morning? Not the church of See, this is one of the devil's most effective tools. I'd say it's probably his second effective tool. I don't know if it's even better. Uh, but it has to do with religious division. I believe that denominationalism is a concept that, that Satan made up. He, he made it up because he, he's creating these religious groups that are just so close 
to what the New Testament church is. Just so close. If he gets people to embrace those type of things and those, those methodologies, and methodolog methodologies and philosophies, he gets them to embrace those things, then people will feel comfortable when we're going to a church. They will feel comfortable all I have to do is be a good moral person. They will feel comfortable all I need to do is keep the Ten Commandments. They, they'll feel comfortable in all that. And the problem is their comfort level won't take them to heaven. It's, it's so sad, but I, be, I firmly believe that's the devil's tool. Religious division or denominationalism, however you want to characterize it, is the, is the tool of the devil that's going to take more people to hell than atheism will. Because there are millions and millions of people sitting in pews just like we are, uh, maybe not tonight, but maybe they were this morning. Millions and millions of people who just feel comfortable that they're going to a church and the pastor tells them that they're okay. All you have to do is believe. It's more than that. It does make a difference what we believe, doesn't it? It does make a difference what one believe because uh, there, this concept doesn't work in other areas. What do you think about investments? If you took the idea, well, it doesn't make any difference what, what stock you buy, you, you're just a, a fool just losing his money. Because, you know, you could put your money in something that it's not going to be good. You know, a lot of people do, and the stock market's not a thing that I'm involved in in a great deal or a way, but either they, they make an investment and they think, okay, they do the research and this is the best thing, and then sometimes they still even lose money. Why would you put money in something that you absolutely do not believe in? You, you put money in something you believe in, you know, and, you know, Wall Street, you know, tells us to do that, and you invest in a company, you believe it's a good investment, you could easily lose all your money. And so you invest in something that, that where it doesn't make any difference, like you're trying to buy Enron stock now. <laughs> you know, that, they're, not, they're not business, they don't sell stocks, but somebody's going to sell you Enron stock. But you believe them. You believe what they say. You know, I'm, a, I'm a prophet also, right? You believe what they say. You, 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 buy, you buy anything. But what about, what about our health? You know, when we think about this concept, what if you drink a glass of liquid believe it's water? If it's poison, you know, you're going to die. Well, I believe it's water. And, and as you're gasping and foaming at the mouth, you're like, get rid of water. <laughs> that's how people are sometimes in religion. That they, they're just, and that's what's going to happen, is they lose their soul. They're going to die over something that they believed in, their dad believed in, their granddad believed in. You know, they all believed in it, except the problem was they were believing something that wasn't true. It was a lie. It's not hard for us to find that out. We've got to believe anything. It does make a difference. It does make a difference if your God is the God of the Bible. You know, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, you know, talks about uh, without faith it's impossible to please Him. But he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. And who, who is God? Is the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Is it Allah, which is not the God of the Bible? Is it Buddha? Uh, is it Krishna? I mean, you know, the, you have to believe something about God, right? But what is your belief in God? Is it based on truth or is it based on fantasy? Oh, what about Christ? John 8, 21 says, he said, you shall die in your sins. Unless you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Jesus, you have to believe about Jesus and who he is. Uh, some religious groups don't believe that Jesus uh, is the Son of God. They believe he's a created being. Okay. And that's, you, but it makes a difference what you believe. I study with those people. And I tell them, if we can't get together on the deity of Jesus, we can't get together on anything. There's no reason to study about the end time, Armageddon, uh, or whatever. We can't get together that Jesus is the Son of God, not a created being. I said, we're, we're, there's a real problem. But salvation comes through that knowledge and that belief and understanding of who He is. And the truth, John 8, 32, the truth, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. As a matter of fact, there's a prohibition in Galatians chapter 1, 6 to 9. He said, now look, he said, if you embrace anything other than what we've taught you, he's talking about the apostles, because we're inspired. He said, let him be accursed. If anyone brings another gospel to you than what we have taught you, let him be a curse. Let him be anathema. Cast him out. And there are people today who are promoting another gospel, 
Another way of, certainly another way of salvation, those type of things. What, what we have here in the Bible, you see, is an objective standard. It's a fixed standard. I'll give you a kind of an example of what a fixed standard looks like. Here's a fixed standard. Every tape measure you're going to buy is going to be based on this amount being a foot. Here's a foot. That's why that I get it. <laughs> That's a foot, but it's not this foot. And what about a, a yard? Like a yard stick. That's three feet, 36 inches, a yard. All right? There's no, no, there's no debate. That's not a yard. See, that's subjective. You say, well, I think that's a yard. But if you work on a construction crew and a guy tells you cut, go cut a board three feet long, it better be that long. Well, he'll fire you. <laughs> well, you can't read a tape measure? What's wrong with you, boy? It's an objective standard. That's what we have to go by. We don't have to worry about what we think about something. We think three feet can't be that far. We don't have to worry about that, do we? We have an objective standard to go by, something to go by, a rule, a tape measure, or any, any measuring device. You know, what if it says, you know, teaspoon of salt? You put a tablespoon of salt. What well, taste the same? You know, or if you mix them up, a teaspoon of salt, and, or a teaspoon of three tablespoons of sugar, and you put in three tablespoons of salt. That's not going to taste good at all. And that's what we're talking about here, the objective standard. That everybody can come to understand the Bible. God has made it such that everybody should be able to understand it if you're willing to approach it with the right approach. And so we have a fixed standard, and it does make a difference for us to believe, because the Bible tells us what we are to believe in, what we are to practice, and therefore that's what we can go to, that fixed standard. Fixed standard in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13, talks about those things that are written. 1 Peter 4, verse 11, talks about the oracles of God. 1 Corinthians 14, 37, talks about the commandments that are given. Not the Ten Commandments, the commandments of Christ. And the Word of God, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, that was given to us by the Holy Spirit. Inspired scriptures, that is, it is uh, um, characterized in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. The scriptures that are god Breathe. All scripture is given by inspiration that words God created. And words were chosen by the Holy Spirit and used those individuals' vocabularies to write those things down. So it is, it does make a difference. Well, let's look at the difference today. John 8, 21 and 24. Again, those passages where Jesus said, Unless you believe I be, you shall die in your sins. So let's look and just kind of examine that. Those who believe in Christ says their sins will be forgiven and they're going to heaven. And then it says, Those who do not believe in Christ. Uh, there are those who will die in their sin, and they're not going to heaven. Now, now that's pretty simple. You know, and you need somebody, you know, with an advanced degree to really mess it up. And because they'll try to give you some way of trying to uh, kind of wipe that out, if you will. But either you, you believe in Christ or you don't. It's just that simple. And those who believe in Christ, their sins will be forgiven to go to heaven. Those who don't believe in Christ, their sins will not be forgiven, and they can't go to heaven. Do you see how easy that is, and how simple it is? I love the simplicity of Scripture. Second Thessalonians 2. We're going to make a comparison here in verses 10 and 12. Look what we see here when it talks about those who believed the lie. They were deceived. They didn't have a love for the truth. They were deluded. Uh, they believed in a lie. They didn't believe in truth. They had pleasure in unrighteousness. And what would happen to them? They're going to perish. What about those who espouse the truth and they're condemned? What about those who espouse the truth? Those, are those who would love the truth, who would believe the truth, and as a result of that, they'd be saved. You believe a lie, you believe the truth. A young prophet believed a lie. He didn't believe the truth. God told him specifically not to go anywhere and drink or, or eat with anybody. What did he do? Just went, all right, did it, because the other guy said, well, look. He said, I, I I have a doctor of ministry, and you know, I'm a prophet like you, but I have a lot more education. And as a result of that, I'm a pastor of a church of 10,000 people, so I, I have more understanding about the Bible than you. How's that? No, 
fun if you do something that's op in opposition to what the Bible says. Yeah, I mean, a, a six or seven year old can understand you you believe in Christ or you don't. I mean, that's pretty pretty clear, pretty pretty simplistic. So again, here's that idea again: do not eat bread, do not drink water, do not return by the same way. Bring it back to your house, and you may eat bread and drink water. He did that which was a lie, and of course, was eaten by a lion. So if you want to get eaten by a lion, you can make sure you understand that it does make a difference what one practices. If not, you can do anything. You can do crazy things. I talked about this this morning about handling snakes in worship. These guys have a rattlesnake in one hand, a cotton mouth in another hand, or a, a, a you know, co you know a copper head, and you know different things. I've seen them do it. I've seen them on. I've seen them on film. I sure not going to any of those places. <laughs> but, uh, well, well, what about immoral acts as worship? You know, we think about you know, kissing and hugging and all those things. Well, you can do that, right? The Temple of Diana in Ephesus was a place where you could go and fornicate with somebody in the guise of religion. I told people, I said, that's probably the most popular religion in Ephesus. You know, there are people in the, in the, uh, the uh, Caribbean islands that smoke marijuana as part of their worship. You know, the Rastafarians uh, and, uh, and some in the Coptic churches, uh, which originated in Egypt. But the Coptic churches, they, they smoke marijuana as part of their worship. What else could you do? Do anything. It does make a difference. You could do anything in worship. But our practice must be authorized by the Bible, by, again, by the Word of God. In, in, in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, we talked about this morning. According to the pattern. Colossians 3, 17, all that you do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so by His, certainly by His authority. 2 John 9, if anyone transgresses the Bible not in the doctrine of Christ, he has not God. But whosoever abideth in the in in, right, in the doctrine of God, he hath both the Father and the Son. So th there is plenty of scripture that teaches this. Philippians 3, verse 16, that we ought to do things by the same rule, by the same pattern, by the way in which we are told to walk. So the difference it made, our practice affects our fellowship with God and also affects our eternal salvation. What difference does it make? It makes a lot of difference. In the Bible is straightforward. Those who would be Christians are, are, are those who would be willing to accept the teachings of Christ that Jesus went to the cross. Be willing to repent of your sins, confess Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, be baptized, and have your sins washed away. It's just that simple. And if you believe something else, then you're not believing the teaching of Scripture. God told me once, he said, uh, he was a denominational pastor of about a thousand people. He said, if you want to learn how to study the Bible, he says, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, skip Acts, go to Romans, and go back to Acts. I thought that was a little interesting. Why, why would he do something like that? Because the book of Romans talks a lot about belief, but it's talking to the church at Rome. You know, they already know. They've already obeyed the gospel. They know you have to do more than just believe, but, but believing continues your, our salvation and it helps to influence our lives. Whereas the book of Acts talks a lot about baptism and all those events. You see, he wanted me to go read Romans first and go back to Acts. Why was that? To influence me in a different way. The Bible tells us and gives us the information we need to make conclusions. We just have to be logical in our thinking because if we, if we are baptized, have our sins washed away, we have a new start. We have a fresh start. And, and the Lord will continue to influence us through the Word of God. To be faithful unto death. Tonight if you're here and you're not a Christian. Or tonight if you're here and you are a Christian. And you've not been living the faithful life. You've not been walking in the light. And you need prayers of the church. You need to repent of your sins. If you would come. All together we stand and sing. We'd be glad to serve.